Lies of P doesn't have parry mechanics. Are you sure about that? Why? Well, after 46 hours, I finished the game. And after struggling a lot and learning how to play it, I realized that the game wasn't built with this mechanic in mind, but I will talk about that later. Lies of P is clearly inspired by many elements from different games. The aggressive combat from Bloodburn, the hopeless environment from Dark Souls, and a dash of storytelling beats from Final Fantasy. In today's video, we will do a deep down about different aspects of the game, and we will touch on the semi-controversy of the parry. But overall, I must say that I really enjoy it. There were many moments where I was full in love, and others where I was really frustrated. The reception of the game has been extremely positive, and thanks to that, in less than a month they sold 1 million units. I am adding this post recording, but the director recently confirmed that there's gonna be a sequel plus they're doing a DLC. We will talk about that later. A week after launch, the game released a patch, but I have to praise that, unlike a certain space game that forces you to quick travel everywhere, Lies of P doesn't have bug or performance issues. The patch was only to do gameplay balances. So, what is Lies of P about? The game is a Souls-like RPG where we control the clever one, and we have to face the horrors that happen in the city of Krat, a beautiful Parisian-inspired place that was built and run by puppets. Their citizens live a very lavish life thanks to the innovation of puppets, which are powered by something called Ergo, the main currency of the game. Life was well, beautiful and good. Krat was the city to go and enjoy good food, theater, and an exquisite nightlife. The dream was real, until a fateful day when the puppets went crazy and started to exterminate every person on sight. This massacre is referred to as the Puppet Frenzy. Our objective is simple, rescue Krat from the puppets. Additionally, there's something else that roams the streets, the petrification disease. The more we play, the more things we will discover and the more we will start to piece together what happened while discovering the secrets behind this bougie city. By the way, I want to quickly address something. There will be some footage with my face on it, with questionable visuals since I was misusing OBS. I'll try to use that footage as little as possible. I promise you that the quality of the recording is better. Okay, let's continue. On our journey, we will encounter a myriad of characters. Many of them have very simple requests, and once you complete them, you won't ever touch them again. But there are center NPCs that will either change positions in the city or will be in the main central hub of the game, Hotel Krat. Here, we will develop the relationship with the survivors, and we will do basic actions like leveling up and upgrading our weapons. Later on, we will unlock something called P-Organ. This will unlock a skill tree that has an impact on the gameplay mechanics. In order to unlock a skill, we have to use Quartz, which we will find in certain treasure chests or after defeating certain bosses and mini-bosses. Besides the stylish and flashy gameplay, the game offers some defensive moves, Guard and Perfect Guard. We can guard almost any attack, and when we do so, there will be a guard to gain, and depending on certain things, you will gain less or more. It's one-to-one -to, -one to the rally system from Bloodbird, but you need to guard instead of just taking damage. To do a perfect guard, you must do it at the precise moment that an enemy attacks. If you do so, you won't take HP damage and your stamina will decrease a bit. Doing constant perfect guards can cause certain enemies' weapons to break, and it helps to build grogginess. Grogginess is something unique to Lies of P. In order to do a fatal attack, like the visceral attacks on Bloodburn, you must do constant damage to the enemy, plus perfect guards. After a while, the HP bar of the enemy will flash, then you have to land a charge heavy attack and after that, the game will allow you to do a fatal attack, which causes nice damage. It isn't massive, but it surely helps. In theory, perfect guard and grogginess sounds great, but they have many flaws and I already teased it in the opening, but suffice to say, it works fine. Underneath our energy, there are three blue bars, they are Fable Chargers. Fable Arts is another special mechanic that recharges by attacking enemies or by using a special item. The important thing about Fable Arts is that they're used to cause either Fable Attack or a special buff. The attacks or effects will hugely change depending on the weapon that you use. Talking about that, 
La SOP has a unique weapon system. Almost all weapons can break down to the handle and to the blade. You can separate them and mix them with other weapons. This will change how the weapon functions. You can use a long handle with a dagger blade or the handle of a dagger to cause quick attacks with a huge weapon. Besides the benefits of the mechanical change of the weapon, the scaling stat of any weapon is tied to the handle, so you can take a big sword that scale with strength and scale it with dexterity or magic. And I know that the name of the stats are different, but come on, you get it. The only restriction of this system will be with boss weapons. Those ones cannot be disassembled, but they're usually more powerful than regular weapons, and they possess exclusive mechanics and fable arts. Another unique mechanic is the Lion System. Since the game is highly inspired by the Tale of Pinocchio, we will encounter moments where we have to choose to lie or tell the truth. It will have an impact of the game and create interesting situations. The fun part is that puppets cannot lie, but for some reason we can, which will prompt a good mystery of the reasons behind why we are different to the other puppets. Talking about them, of course, they're the main enemies, but early on we will see the consequences of the petrification disease, carcasses, which is when a person is affected from the disease and, for some reason, mutates. Like puppets, we will discover why this happens. Also, we will encounter human enemies. Some of them are regular enemies, while others are mini-bosses or even bosses, that usually have some type of connection to the story, or, at the minimum, they have a connection to the overall lore. Unlike FromSoft games, I have to applaud the devs because the clothes that you wear are tied to any type of stat. They're literally there for the funsies, and you can choose whatever configuration of clothes and headpieces you want to since it won't affect the mechanical aspect of the game, nor it will prompt a different response from NPCs, except a particular thing that happens way later on the game. Lies of P is a really gorgeous game that has a very strong and particular aesthetic that is really pleasant to see. The setting is on the very pokey and that is reflected on the skirts of Krat. You can see many beautiful stores that were ransacked, colorful and bougie signs invite you to different puppet shows or straight up propaganda. The citizens are dressed with fashionable clothes reminiscent of the 1910 and 20 aesthetics and the mechanical construction of the puppets screams steampunk, though the devs have said that it's less that and more very pokey punk. The environment won't be solely exploring the city of Krat. At some point, we will be on a factory, the outskirts of Krat, an opera house, a swamp, etc. The game has amazing sound and music effects. There are certain parts of the game that thanks to the sound effects alone, it can get spooky or even scary. To me, one of the scariest was Central Krat Station, the place where we woke up. The game immediately signals that we are not welcome here. Music is usually reserved for intense moments, yeah, boss fights, though certain places will have regular music like Hotel Crack. A nice addition is music records that we will find through our journey. They're not there just to play random music, but it always has some type of relevance to the lore. Plus, the music has something to do with the lion mechanic. I think that Lies of P is a great game that is flawed and sometimes has some questionable choices, but even then, this game has a lot of potential to become a huge franchise, which is something that I actually want. It's incredible how many games have tried to copy the FromSoft formula, but the devs of Neowiz not only nailed it, but they did their own thing. By playing the game, you can actually tell that they love this type of games, and this is a love letter to the Soulsborne games, the players, and to the devs of Front Software. Well, Paul, this was my quick spoiler-free review. If you want a score, I will say that this game is not lying to you. It has quick, flashy and awesome gameplay, amazing sound design, intense music, the graphics are insanely good and it has zero performance or bug issues. Lies of P is a must if you are craving for a new from software game, or it can be a really good entrance point if you are new to the genre. After all of that, obviously the video will continue. What do you mean? <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? <laughs> so, I decided to divide it in four parts. 1. Who are Neowis? Plus, making of Lies of P. 2. In-depth gameplay mechanics. 3. High and lows of the game. 4. Future of the game. Originally, I was wanting to do one section solely dedicated to the storytelling and a rough timeline of events. I have half of that script done, but after reading all the items and objects of the game, I realized that it's harder to make than you think. 
I was able to easily pinpoint all the events that happened during your playthrough and how many days have transcurred since you wake up. But getting the audience of the events is much trickier since there's a lot of info scattered around. Weirdly enough, it's easy to pinpoint the furthest points of the story, but the closer we get to the creation of Krat and the massacre that happened thanks to the puppet frenzy, the messier it gets. I will try to release that video ASAP, and thanks to reading all the items, I realized many little things that I want to talk about, like how Krat was economically unequal or how puppets were created way before you think so. Before continuing, I want to warn you, this is the end of the spoiler-free part. If you don't want to be spoiled, stop the video, go ahead and like it, and also let me know in the comment section whether you are planning to play it or not and why. If you already did it, but for some reason you don't want to continue the video, let me know what was your favorite boss and why it isn't the Swamp Monster. Neowis is a company that was founded on May 28, 1997 by its current chairman, Sun Kyun Na. The other founder is Chan Byung Gyu, and according to Neowis' page, other five men were also involved in the founding. All of them were colleagues from the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. They chose the word Neowiz because it's a portmanteau of new, neo, and wizard, wiz. It encapsulates our will to become a creative leader in the fast-changing internet world. Their main goal was to introduce innovations to the internet business because it was useless if users weren't connected. The same year, some came up with the idea of a one-click service, which was an automatic internet connection service instead of the confusing process of connecting it manually. I read that they never tried to do this service worldwide because each country has different regulations and it was way too difficult for them to change everything to mold it to a particular country. Instead, they quickly became one of the fastest growing companies in South Korea. By November 1st, 2000, they released a web page called SayClub.com, which was a page to commercialize web avatars. Their first month sold around $200,000 worth of avatar items. It was the very first time that any company in the world tried to do that. Clearly, they had immediate success. After that, they launched pmang.com, a game web page portal with different type of games. They did this because after the success of the one-click service, Korea Telecom immediately jumped into that business and it became really competitive and they were afraid of getting behind. Little by little, they started to grow their online presence with MMORPG, gambling games, FPS games, plus their Wave Avatars page. They are so renowned and important in South Korea that by 2007, they were able to negotiate with EA the release of FIFA Online in South Korea. I tried to dig more information between 2007 and 2020, but honestly, I wasn't able to find relevant or interesting information. All there is is little information about their business model, but there isn't something big like Lies of P. As I mentioned, their main monetization comes from those two web pages, plus, clearly, mobile monetization. <laughs> if you don't know, the main gaming movement in South Korea is through mobile. There, gaming on consoles is not that big or popular, which surprises me even more to know why Neowis decided to make such a radical departure from what they've done for decades. I have a theory about that, but first, let's talk about the making of. We know for a fact that the development of the game started in 2020. The game is developed by Round 8 Studios. At first, I was a little bit confused because there is no information about them, but later, I understood that Round 8 Studios was created around 2020 and it's a subsidiary of Neowis. In other words, once Neowis approved the project, they approved the creation of this studio. If you see the logos when loading the game or at any promotional material, you will see that there is something called NOTH. Excuse me, why? To explain this, let me talk about the article where I pulled a lot of information from. It was an interview done to Chon Ji Won, the director of the game, by the webpage Prankster101. Is Round 8 the development company or is it Neowis? Neowis is the game company and Round 8 is the studio under Neowis and there are two projects going on under Round 8 and one of them is Team Nuff, which is enough without the E. It means that we are still not enough, we are still not satisfied with our resort. 
I wasn't able to find more interesting behind the scenes about the game, since many of the recent interviews to Choi are more about the actual content and promotion of the game and less about the making of. Why the fuck you lying? In the description, there will be links to all sources that I used to make this video. Go ahead and check that interview to have more insight about the making of the game. Having said that, I think I know why Neowis approved to make Lies of P. I found an IGN interview by Richard Ahiyoshi to Neowis back in 2007. Some of the information about the company I pull it directly from there. The subtitle of this article read as, we find out about this highly successful Korean game company that is extending its presence into the global market. If you look for information about Neowis, the articles that you will stumble the most are about the deal they made with EA for FIFA Online in 2007. They all shared something in common global market. This means that they have unsuccessfully tried to expand themselves to overseas markets for the last 15 years. I already alluded to it, but in Asia, people love mobile games. Other gaming forms, special consoles, aren't necessarily the most popular way to play games. So, I believe Neowis approved Lies of P to make that dream true, expand to the global market. You can create the most polished and revolutionary video game ever done, but globally, it won't have that much of an impact if it's only in mobile. Look at Final Fantasy VII Ever Crisis. Everyone was really excited and after a week, the boss pretty much died and one of the biggest reasons is because it's a mobile only game. I believe this because in the same interview to Choi, the team of Prankster asked, Neowis is the publisher. You have to excuse my ignorance and I say this with the utmost respect, but I've never heard of Neowis, even though the publisher is now creating wave with Lies of P. Why do you think gamers haven't heard of Neowis enough in the past? I myself am thinking that it's a miracle to bring this game into the world. So, I don't think it's so crazy that not many people know about Neowis. Also, Neowis is a Korean company and, as I said, the Korean gaming market is not so well geared towards consoles and it's mainly around mobile. The company is also open to adventure and taking risks. For that, we wanted to compensate Neowis by bringing more popularity to Neowis, so that motivated the team to develop the game and make it better. I think this summarizes well enough the making of this game. We have a company that trusts their team and their devs. They even give them time to learn how to develop on console. Your parent company, Neowis, is located in Korea. What challenges have you had as a game developer who is based in Korea, not only from the context of a Korean developer who develops games in Korea, but also as a developer who is developing Korea games in the context of a worldwide market? So, the hardest thing for me was developing this game as a console game. It was very hard, because in Korea, the game market is mainly about mobile games, so it was hard to find someone who has experience in console games. So. When we faced issues on making console games, we couldn't find anyone who has experience or knowledge about the issue, so we had to crash course ourselves and learn and improve ourselves. It's incredible that Neowis was willing to do all of this and they 100% trusted Team Nuff because Lies of P was a massive risk that had a great payoff. Also, I think that not knowing how to develop on console was a secret blessing because that was a huge reason why the game is so good. They had to be on the same or above any regular western developed team. They took their disadvantage and turned it into a great game. I have many issues with certain mechanics, but knowing that they had such hindrance makes me like it even more. Having said that, this is a perfect segue to talk about the juicy stuff. Guard and perfect guard are not parries, period. When you parry on a video game, it's usually with the intent of deflecting attacks and, if possible, make a counter move. On Dark Souls, we can do a parry with our shield followed by a counter move, a repost. On Bloodburn, timing your fireman with the attack of your enemy fully stops them and opens them up for a visceral attack. But he ha you have more chances of doing visceral attacks because he decides to go melee. All right, all right. On Resident Evil 4 Remake, the devs add a parry mechanic. You can deflect almost all the enemy's attacks with your knife, except fist and kicks. Unless you play as a cross or a wizard, which you can parry whatever you want to. On Lies of P, we have a guard and perfect guard, which are not parries. 
there are blockers or shielders or upsolders, whatever the hell you want to name them. I know that this sounds pedantic and that I'm going after the semantics, but give me a chance to explain myself. As I mentioned, you can block almost any attack of any enemy when you guard by keep pressing L1. The Peta's puppet will simply raise his weapon and hand to shield himself from damage. Depending on the weapon, your stats and the progression of the P organ, you will be able to block more damage and have more guard regain. Vitality is tied not only with having more HP, but with the guard regain itself. For the second time, I mentioned that you can block most attacks. So, what attacks can you block? Fury attacks. They are powerful charge attacks with a red aura that you cannot just block. If you try to do so, the enemy will just hit you. You must do a perfect guard if you don't want to take damage, or be far away so you can successfully dodge it. So, mechanically speaking, a perfect guard is very similar to a parry, but they have different end goals. Great. What's the difference between a perfect guard and a regular parry then? Why are you talking so much about that? What the f*** does that have to do with anything? As I said, guard or perfect guard aren't a parry. In the examples that I mentioned, every time that you do it, there's something in common. If you do it correctly, you deflect and then counteract, no questions asked. In Last of P, when you do a perfect guard, your reward will be not to take damage, and it helps to build grogginess. In other words, perfect guard doesn't stop enemy's attacks. You may think that I have a dumb take or this is a minor inconvenience, but once you fight a miniboss or a boss, you will quickly realize how underwhelming the perfect guard mechanic can be. No matter what game you play, making a very time parry or dodge is difficult, and once you do it, you usually are rewarded for your effort. On Bayonetta, which time is an essential gameplay element. Each time that we dodge at the precise moment, time slows and you have the opportunity to quickly destroy enemies. One of the hardest moments is when the game blocks you from doing that. When you don't have it, you quickly realize how difficult the game actually is. The same can be said about Lies of P. Since Perfect Guard doesn't stop enemies' attacks and only protects you, you will get frustrated when a boss makes a Seeds combo attack with a red finisher and you have no way to stop it. Early on in the game, I got stuck on the Fuoco boss fight. He was the first boss that I encountered that made that particular pattern of attacks, since dodging the tanks of Parade Master, Mad Duncan, and Scrap Watchman was relatively easy, but it wasn't with him. I got really frustrated that I was trying to do perfect guards and failing, but when I was able to do them, my reward was to block one of his many strings of attacks. Again, this seems like a minor inconvenience until you see the high pattern of attacks from bosses like the Swamp Monster, Latsatia, or Nameless Puppet. The only way that I was able to continue the game was when I got stuck with Fuoco. After an hour of misery, I decided to farm for about 6 or 7 hours and I took that chance to improve my skills. While farming, I finally understood that this game wasn't built with a parry mechanic in mind and that Perfect Guard is not a parry. Once I internalized that, the game became much more bearable. But Matt, the game has dodge, why don't you just dodge? Well. It is actually explained in game that you can't dodge them and you will get hit mid roll unless you're far away enough that it's physically impossible for the enemy to hit you. I've noticed that this is a very divisive point because it doesn't function like a traditional parry, but it has advantages. I mentioned earlier that it can help to break weapons, and it's kinda true. In order to break an enemy weapon, you just have to pull off a perfect guard and the enemy's weapon will briefly shine on red. Eventually it will break and you will notice the low damage, but taking into consideration that it's really complicated to do a perfect guard and it's lengthy to break them, it's not something that you will always do. After grinding many things in the P organ, I never could break any boss weapon because it feels impossible. About grogginess, you have to be really smart, because without upgrading that on the P organ, grogginess will vanish very quickly, and sadly, this game has no poise, meaning any enemy attack can and will interrupt you. This creates some frustrating moments where, after countless perfect guards and regular attacks, the enemy is finally in a groggy state only for you to miss it because you weren't fast enough to do a charge R2 attack for a myriad of reasons. 
This is especially noticeable in the beginning of the game, when you cannot upgrade your P-Organ, and you will have, at best, around 4 to 7 seconds to do it, though with upgrades that won't be an issue. In my opinion, the hardest part of the entire game is the beginning. Besides not knowing how to play, you're not put in situations where you have to constantly do perfect guards and practice that mechanic. About poise, I mentioned that the player doesn't have this mechanic, which means interruption of attacks won't only affect regular and charge attacks, but fable arts as well. Early on, it takes forever for the fable chargers to reload. It was so bad that for more than half of the game, I neglected this mechanic because I felt that it was useless to use something that any enemy would easily interrupt. Let's talk about that. Fable arts are really varied, but for the most part, almost all the weapons have a configuration of a passive effect and an attack. The blade has one fable art different from the handle, which creates interesting combinations if you choose to. Some arts cost one charge, others two, and others three, but never more than that, and you can quickly tell how many charges it will use. My recommendation is to always test them on the garden, next to the hotel since you cannot run out of fable chargers or legion. Besides upgrading your weapon, the only way to strengthen fable arts is through the P-Organ. The P-Organ is powered by using quads, which you will naturally get them on the game. In order to activate a skill, you need to first add them as slots, and once you complete the set, the skill you choose will activate. When you choose a quartz, the game will give you an option to add a mini skill that will be beneficial. Here, you can unlock things like getting more ergo after destroying enemies, enhancing the effects or duration of your consumable items, carrying more pull cells, improving your general attack, etc. Once you fill all the slots, you can choose another skill and you rinse or repeat. After unlocking two skills, you advance to the next phase. In the main game, there are five phases, and in total, there are seven. Two of them are hidden, and you unlock each one once you get to New Game++. Plus Plus. Unlike many games, items on Lies of P are actually very useful, especially throwables. With smart allocation of points in the P-Organ and your stats, any throwable can be a nuke. I saw videos of people literally throwing everything and demolishing bosses. You can do that, but personally, I don't find it fun or fulfilling to do, but I like that the game gives you the possibility of playing however you want to. A special item that you will get before going into the cathedral is the Q. It's an item that Mr. Giangio will happily give you and it's empowered by wish stones. Each wish stone has a different effect, but I'm going to say right now, almost all of them suck. Much later in the game, you can have the option to wield more wish stones, and it will be important, but for a very, very long time, you won't really use them that much. Why? Maybe should use these bats and see what's, what it does. So this should give me a passive regeneration. Yeah, it's doing it. Oh, well, it's better than nothing. Uh, oh, that heals nothing. What a shitty wish. <laughs> you get way more HP by using a pulse hell or by guarding and regaining the HP. Once you advance more on the plot, you will be able to change which wish stone you want to use. And I have to say, the vast majority of them suck as much as that lane HP recharge. The only one that truly matters and the only reason why I unlock the skill to wear more wish stones is the friendly one. Before certain bosses, you can use an item that you will easily get called Star Fragment. It's used to summon a spectre to help you through a boss fight. The spectres are AR control and they don't do that much damage, but they shine because they distract the boss enough to give you time to heal, recharge your energy, poke some free damage, and easily use a charge R2 attack. About your item list, you will easily be able to track the HP of the spectre. When you use the friendly wish stone, it heals half of your spectre HP. That's why they're the only ones that truly matter. In order to buy wish stones, we need a special currency, gold coin fruits taken from the gold coin tree. This tree is hidden in the hotel. It surprised me that so late in the game, you not only find this new currency, but it rather reconnects with the hotel, which brought me back to the superb interconnectivity of Dark Souls. Each 9 minutes, the tree will produce one fruit, and it can hold a maximum amount of 8. You will be able to easily track how many fruits it has, Plus, you can use a special item so it makes fruits more quickly, and you can unlock options on the P-Organ to improve it. Honestly, I never did that, because outside of the very few occasions, you can only use the golden fruit with Giangio. I was disappointed with the coins because very quickly you will have a ton of them and nothing worthwhile to spend. I wish we could use them for something else or even trade them for Ergo. 
So it makes no sense to invest any quartz for that on the P-organ, unless you literally match out everything else. Since we are at the Hotel Krat, let's talk about their inhabitants. The game forces you to always go back there in order to level up, so let's meet the group. Sofia is the most important character, period. Personally, besides the petals puppet, she's my favorite. Almost 90% of the game will level up through her. She will always happily greet you as the clever one, and on the first interaction, she will give you a really good item, the Moon Face Pocket Watch. With it, you will be able to freely go back to the hotel or to the last stargazer that you interacted with. It has unlimited uses and no negative effects, bypassing certain annoying fast travel mechanics from regular Souls-like games. Since I mentioned it, let's quickly explain the stargazers. They are the bonfires of the game. I personally found their positions to be in the Goldilocks zone, neither too far away or way too close to each other. I have to give props to the devs, because when you have a boss fight, the stargazer will always be next to the door of the boss. Stargazers won't be there just to teleport and recharge your pool cells, but eventually you will be able to switch your legion arm, assemble weapons, switch the greenstone and the cubes wishstone, use the storage, and sometimes you will have an extra option with a unique application, like talking with Gemini. Very close to the end, you will also be able to level up here instead of going to Sofia, but that happens for some low reasons that we will explore in another video. We can freely teleport to any previous stargazer without any type of restriction, and a nice detail is that when we are on a teleport page, if we completed any request or an NPC wants to talk with us, here it will appear the face of the person, bypassing the tedious process of guessing if we completed a quest or when an NPC has new information. Going back to the hotel guests, we have Eugenie. With her, we will be able to upgrade our weapons, assemble and disassemble weapons, and use cranks for the handle. To upgrade our weapons, we will need moonstones that are at gather on the world. The more we progress, the more special the moonstone needs to be and the harder it will be to get them. But luckily, we don't really need a very specific or obscure item to fully upgrade any weapon. I'm a good Christian woman, honey. I have nothing to say to that. It's just the next tire of the moonstone. One of the earliest ways to get them is through the dimensional butterflies, which are a one-time enemy that will always drop a special item. We know that we are close to one because the lamp will suddenly change to red, if a butterfly is summoned and we don't beat it, we can always rest in a stargazer and go back and try again. The Legion Arms are another unique element of the game. We start with a basic one that does a very slow attack, but eventually we will be able to unlock different Legion Arms with a large range of uses. The yellow bar underneath the name of the arm is Legion, the resource to use the arm. Early on, it depletes very quickly, but eventually, you can have a ton of it, and very late, you can even unlock a skill that has a passive regeneration. Being honest, I really felt underwhelmed with the arm. I know that you can do crazy stuff with a string one, but in high stressful situations, like huge boss fights, I wasn't thinking about using it. I know that many people like it, I don't. Moving on, we use the special cranks with Eugenie. Much earlier, I mentioned that the handles are tied with the scaling of your stats, meaning when you upgrade your weapon, you're only upgrading the blade part. The handle has nothing to do with that. But with cranks, you can level up once any of the three stats of the handle. Motivity, Technique, and Advance, Strength, Dexterity, and Magic. All the weapons scale with both motivity and technique, but not all of them with advance. If, for some reason, you want to add an advanced crank to a handle that doesn't have it, or take an advanced weapon and improve the motivity, you can do it. But it's better to upgrade one level of the best stat of the handle. For example, I use one technique crank with this sword to improve it from A to S. Later in the game, someone very vital will join our case, Mr. Lorenzini Venigni, the owner of the factory Venini Works. He will offer three special services, the ability to build more legion arms, deciphering codes, and added a greenstone on a grinder. Through the game, we will get some cipher codes, and he's the only one that can decipher them. You will find the codes through the game, or by doing some very easy quests. The code always points you towards some type of hidden treasure. The biggest one is a small new area in the swamp, the Hermit's Cave. After a while, Venini will unlock the ability to add a greenstone on a grinder. The grey bar that is above our equipment weapon represents the durability of said weapon. Naturally, it will go down by using it, blocking or being affected with acid. 
To restore it, we will need to use a grinder, though it's a little bit slow. We can also use a Benigni repair tool that will immediately repair it or, if we are close to, when we interact with a Stargazer, it will always be repaired. Going back to Benini, he can add a grindstone with different temporary effects like coating your weapon on fire, electricity or acid, having more chances to cause criticals, etc. It's a very situational item and another one that I truly didn't use that much. Pulcinella is Benigni's assistant, and he will open a store, focus on selling cranks, certain weapons, grindstones, and certain defensive items. To upgrade the store, we need to recover special boxes that we will naturally find on the game. Polendina is like Pulcinella, he has a store where we can buy and sell some goodies, and like Pulcinella, we need to find boxes to upgrade Polendina's store. That store is focused on consumable and throwable items. Pulcinella is the protector of Lady Antonia, the current owner of Hotel Krat. She will give us lore information and, at two points, she will be indispensable to continue the game. Alidoro is the NPC that will sell us boss and amulet weapons. We encounter him on the rooftops of the cathedral, and no matter what, he will relocate to the hotel. After defeating any boss, they will drop a special ergo that we use it to trade with him. As I said, all the boss weapons and amulets are special compared to the regular ones. You have to choose between getting a weapon or an amulet with a single ergo boss item, though in New Game Plus you will be able to get the other option. All his amulets have some type of special benefits. One that I used during the entire playthrough, and I don't care if you call me a cheater, is an amulet that allows you to dodge even if you don't have energy. That amulet really saved me many times. Eventually, for some storytelling reasons, Alidoro will relocate to the swamp and his final place will be underneath the hotel. Another resident is Belle, we encounter her at the Grand Exhibition. I really don't have anything to say about her because she's really boring and unimportant. Moving on, the final NPC is Geppetto, our father. We will rescue him after fighting Mad Donkey, and he will provide a lot of context to the situation that is going on. I will talk more in depth about the lore behind our main cast in another video. Since I mentioned Mad Donkey, it's a great time to talk about boss and miniboss fights. Bosses are mixed with the location where we fight them, and they have some type of thematic relevance with respect to the environment that we are currently traversing. In simple words, the environment will hint us about what we are gonna fight. The first boss of the game is Parade Master. Shortly before we fight him, we will encounter Circus Parafernalia that, by the way, the cutouts are a nice foreshadow for some mini-bosses that we will encounter. I decided to name them as the Frenzied Circus Show. We have Mad Clown, Crazy Jester, Enraged Kid, and Exploded Marionette, though the marionette is a regular enemy. Also, there is this cutout of a lady riding a monocycle, but we never encounter this enemy or someone similar. I wonder if it will be an enemy for the DLC. Then we have other bosses like the Black Rabbit Brotherhood where we will encounter a hit not about them. Each boss will have a second phase and others, in addition, will have a second health bar. Parade Master mid-fight will use his head as a weapon. Andreus will show his real form and let Seisha, well, let Seisha will just go crazy. Many bosses have something that I name as Frenzy Attacks. Fury Attacks are the regular heavy red attacks that you can only perfect guard, but Frenzy Attacks are long strings of attacks that sometimes feel like they leave you no room to breathe. Even though I don't think that the game has a boss like Gascoigne, meaning a boss fight designed to force you to engage with the mechanics, I have to say that Foco was a roadblock because I realized that I couldn't just dodge, which eventually prompted me to farm and learn the mechanics of the game. The game lacks optional and big areas to explore. This isn't an issue by itself, but because of this, the game has very few optional bosses. Most of them are behind a dialogue option and they're not hidden or you have to get out of your way to find them. In Bloodborne, monsters like Dark Beast Pearl or Martin Lugarius are awesome because you have to go out of your way to get to this new area that is unrelated to the main quest. I missed exploring and finding new hidden locations. 
The only one it's the Hermes Cave and it's a very small place with a minibus at the end that we have already fought several times. The difficulty of each boss will be in gradual crescendo, being Parade Master the easiest one while the most difficult one, well, Minibuses act as a barrier to continue between areas. Some minibuses are incredibly easy. For quite a while, most human fights are very easy to deal with, while others are incredibly tough. Surprise, mother Something that I noticed is that most enemies give little ergo. For a very long time I was worried because in Bloodburn, getting 100k blood echoes is with luck to levels. This makes farming a little bit annoying since you will feel like you are not getting enough resources, more so if you are constantly buying items. But the devs were really smart since the plateau for maximum ergo will cap around 16k. In other words, once you are around level 100, each time that you level up, the maximum amount of ergo to keep leveling up will get stuck at around 16k, needing one extra ergo per level. As expected, when you level up, you can allocate your points however you want to. The vast majority of points, I allocate them into capacity. Uh -huh. Why? Wait. You see, at the beginning, you can equip 4 defensive parts plus 2 amulets, which you later expand to 4 and 5 on New Game Plus. Each new defensive part will weight more, and some amulets will also weight more, especially boss fight amulets, they're the heaviest one. Weapons also have a huge impact on weight. The bigger, the better, but also, they will weight more. With more weight, the clever one will be slower and roll slower. Probably, most of you got stuck being slightly overweight, which is fine, but you will notice that the consumption and recharge of energy is considerably large and slow. You will notice the impact of the weight in lengthy fights, where you need the most amount of energy possible to attack and dodge, and you notice that it doesn't go up, and in those fights, it's not a good idea to just back away. After a couple of hours, I realized that the most important stat is capacity, because you need that your energy recharges as quickly as possible. Sometimes I had to wear only one weapon and a crappy defensive part and keep changing them between fights, because I prefer that rather than having a slow energy recharge. I am getting ahead, but I have to admit, I really dislike this mechanic because it doesn't bring anything superb and special to the game. Instead, it's just an annoying mechanic that made me waste around 42 points that I could've allocated in more important stuff. This isn't exclusive to Lies of P, but I found weight systems to be really annoying and underwhelming because you're going to waste a lot of time and effort just to carry stuff. I understand the limitations, but I'm going to be transparent. Every time that there is a weight system, either I end up installing a mod to remove that, cheating, or just like here, wasting almost half of the points just to have regular recharge and speed. Those are all the mechanics that I want to talk about. There's more details that I'm reserving for later, but for now, I have to say that mechanically speaking, the game is fantastic. As much as I don't like that much guard and perfect guard nor the delay attacks or wasting points in capacity, I have to admit that my biggest mistake was trying to play Lies of P as if it is a from software game. I was trying to apply the logic that I know about Souls-like games and treat it like that. I am nowhere near close to being good with Souls-like games and I always try to make those games as easy as possible. I mean, the first time I played Dark Souls, I got so stuck that I decided to destroy as many enemies as possible using the bow, and it kinda worked. Flash forward around 10 years later, I was able to understand the logic behind Bloodburn's guns. Literally, I played Bloodburn for the first time very recently, about 2 months before Lies of P came out, and I got the visceral and gun system pretty quickly. It was so good that when I was in Kanehurst, I decided to make a count of how many viscerals I was doing because I kept breaking my weapon and I thought that the only way to continue was to visceral everything. It's one of the moments that I have had the most fun in any video game that I ever played, but here I was stuck. 
I felt like the guard or perfect guard mechanics were useless and underwhelming. And don't get me wrong, I still think that they're not that great, but it was a me issue because I was applying my previous knowledge instead of just learning the game. In fact, I got so stuck with Fuoco that I made a red post calling guard and perfect guard useless. I disagree with certain points of my post because Lies of P has parry mechanics. So that was a fucking lie. I know that I say that the game doesn't have parry mechanics. I lied. But at the same time, I didn't. It's true that parry mechanics exist in the game, but they have a huge asterisk. If we dissect the base gameplay, technically speaking, there isn't a parry mechanic, except with certain things. With Fable Arts, there are some weapons like the Wintry Rapier, which you can choose as your first weapon that has a defensive Fable Art that if you use it, you parry. The problem? It needs one Fable Charge. It's not that much, but as I already mentioned, early on it takes forever for the stupid blue bar to refill. Making a perfect guard is already difficult, and adding a parry tied to a resource that recharges slowly discouraged me to never practice and use it. If this was ingrained as a mechanic without a resource, I don't think that people's comments or even mine about guard or perfect guard will hold true since all you need is timing. Then we have Aegis Fable Arm, which is a shield and it's not like it will parry, but it will protect you from attacks, including the red ones, but it really sucks. It was way easier and better just to guard or perfect guard, and unless you use a lot of legion recharge items or you choose certain stuff on your P organ, you will encounter the same problems as the Fable Arts that I already mentioned. Then we have a special greenstone that, for a certain amount of time, it will cause all your guards to act like a perfect guard, so you just have to keep pressing L1. The issue is that, sure, you won't take damage, but it's not a parry, you just transform momentarily as Hable. Finally, we have a skill on the fourth phase of your P organ. Perfect guard causes stiffness. Basically, when you cast a perfect guard, the enemy will stop its attacks. It's very similar to a regular parry on other games, but there's a little detail. It's not going to happen every perfect guard that you do. It's more like once every 10 or 20 perfect guards. Also, you unlock this very late in the game. I was able to unlock it right before the fight with the final boss. And even then, I forgot I had it because this effect would rarely happen. The only time that you will see it is when you are farming and constantly doing perfect guards and once in a while, you will notice that the enemy backs up. Then, how the f can you make Paris then? Two Dragon's Sword. We can obtain it after defeating the green monster of the swamp and using his special ergo with Alidoro. At the beginning, I wasn't using it that much because I was in love with the circular saw blade. But little by little, I started to notice certain things. First, if you tilt your joystick while attacking, the clever one will kinda move around. It feels like you're dodging while attacking, and with enough practice, you can put yourself behind an enemy while attacking. Then we have the energy use. Compared to other big and heavy weapons, it barely uses any energy, meaning you can make a very long string of attacks. That plus the semi-dodge attack will allow you to easily mow down enemies like nothing. Also, it has a special fable art that allows you to make a very long dodge and if you press triangle again, the Petos puppet will follow it with an attack. But the real deal isn't any of that. The real deal is the charge R2 attack. Nice. When I did this the first time, I was very confused because the clever one just moves the sword, there's a sound and that's it. You can keep holding R2 and he will walk and when you lift it, he will do the charge attack. I pressed many combinations of buttons like he was like that, but I only noticed that you can cancel this when you dodge. Other than that, it does nothing else, not even guard. But while fighting the rubber whistle, I accidentally did this.
I wish I recorded my reaction because I lost my sh I couldn't believe it that after 38 plus hours of gameplay, there it is. You can actually f***ing parry in the game. As you can see, there's a little delay between when you press R2 and the parry animation. It took me a lot of time to get it and to be honest, I didn't master it until 1 or 2 hours before fighting the last boss of the game. But once I understood how to do it, you can make crazy stuff like this. In fact, I can show you the precise moment that I fell in love with the game. When this happened, not only I couldn't believe it, but I was extremely hyped until I finished the game. It was while fighting Nameless Puppet, an optional final boss. He's terrible tough, even more than Natsasia. After 11 tries and 35 minutes, I was able to get to the second phase for the first time. What I'm going to show you is that moment. I had no idea what to expect. How dare you? You're just a puppet. Nothing more. Me? Gundaga. I literally have no words in English to explain how pumped and excited I was that I fucking parried that attack on my first try. So, I will say it in Spanish. que vaina más brutal y genial. Chamo, se lo juro que no me esperaba hacer ese parry y fue, mira, chef kiss. De pana, que vaina más buena y que tan grande es el perfect guard. Que rico se siente hacer cualquier parry con esta espada. Ok, I will start rambling in Spanish, but honestly, the only reason why the two dragon sword is the best weapon of the entire game is because it's the only real and true parry mechanic of the game. It isn't locked behind a resource, a skill tree, you don't need to use a special item, nor there is a BS with it. It's pure mechanical skill, and it's a parry mechanic like any other regular parry mechanic from other games. The best parts are that the clever one will fully stop whatever attack that you choose to parry, and he will always follow it with a charge attack. If an enemy is close to being groggy, if you do it, you will automatically waken any enemy. To me, the beauty of the two dragon swords relies on being a real and true parry, and even though it's harder to pull it off than a perfect guard, the satisfaction of doing it is so much better than continuously perfect guarding while the enemy keeps attacking. I think this is why they didn't add a traditional parry, because it clashes with the mechanics of the game. If other weapons allowed you to do this, you would be untouchable. That's why I think other parries are behind a paywall. I will repeat myself. It wasn't until the last optional boss fight that I truly fell in love with the game and understood how to consistently do it. And don't get me wrong, it's not easy to pull it off. If you do it a little bit fast or slow, the enemy will hit you. Also, with fast paced attacks, it's close to impossible to pull it off, so I usually left it for attacks that had some time to wind up or just for fury frenzy attacks. To me, after learning how to use this sword, it's illogical to continue the game using any other weapon, since no other one gives me the rush and satisfaction that this treasure has. So those were all the mechanical gameplay elements that I wanted to talk about. Now I want to talk about other stuff all related to the parry mechanic because there's some odd choices. For example, the line system. After defeating Parade Master, we have to lie to enter Hotel Krat since puppets cannot lie. Eventually, there are going to be plenty of opportunities to either tell the truth or lie. For a very long time, I thought that this system was going to play a crucial role, but sadly, it doesn't work like that. I was hoping that NPC would change their opinion about the situation that is going on, or maybe opening some paths and closing others. I thought that this system was going to be reflected on the gameplay. The more you lie, the harder the game will be, but you get more rewards and some unique human interactions, whereas keep telling the truth makes the game easier since other puppets recognize you as an equal. My mind went to Dark Souls with Humanity or Insight from Bloodburn. Both mechanics change how you see and play the game. It's not a big and huge change, and you can choose to never participate with these systems, but when you do, you will have access to certain benefits and disadvantages. Sadly, the line system is very lacking, and it only serves two purposes. To get a particular weapon and a particular ending. That's pretty much it. 
I thought that it will allow you to bypass situations or make things harder or easier and make some gameplay changes like not being able to wear exclusive puppet or human equipment. Or telling the truth, a hotel crowd forces you to search a different way to enter, which causes chaos and distress and most of the guests will be hostile until the petos calms everyone. In the end, the lion system was truly disappointing and I think that they could add so much depth to encourage replayability and see the different outcomes when you start to play with the system. Another disappointing mechanic is the P-Organ. I think it was a terrible choice to lock basic gameplay elements behind a skill tree. As I mentioned, depending on how fast you are, you will lock it between 3 and 5 hours after starting the game. I don't mind certain things of the skill tree, like increasing the maximum amount of pull cells that you can carry, or benefits relating to improving your attack, defense, guard regain, etc. That type of stuff is absolutely fine, and I'm okay with it, and I think that slowly unlocking those upgrades is great. What isn't good is locking basic mechanic gameplay elements like double dodging, dodging from the ground, or stun enemies with a perfect guard. This seems minor, but when the demo came out, one of the biggest complaints was that the dodge is way too short and tight. I was surprised when I started playing the game and noticed that this wasn't addressed, even though the director said that they did. They didn't improve or change anything about the dodge because they knew that the P-Organ has a better dodge. And you may agree or disagree with these things, but it is a real and painful issue because in the next patch they're going to add dodging from the ground as a base mechanic, as it should have been. For some reason, you unlock this after some very difficult enemies that constantly hit you while you're on the ground, and when you don't have this skill, there's nothing that you can do but to take the damage. I said this before, but I will repeat it. The worst part of the game is when you don't have access to the P-Organ, because so many station based mechanics are locked behind it, and I have zero clue why the devs chose that instead of giving us base gameplay elements and then the entire skill tree is only to upgrade and even change the behavior of those skills. Now, this is an unpopular opinion that I already mentioned, and I am aware of it, but I truly wasn't in love with the vast majority of weapons and the option to swap the handles since most weapons felt samey to me. I particularly didn't like swapping because it can easily mess up your output damage. I decided to play a technique build and I noticed that if I choose anything but a technique handle, I would immediately notice that my damage output was considerably low. I know I'm being unfair with the game about this because Bloodborne taint my perception thanks to the streak weapons. Not only they're unique and fun to use, but you don't have to worry about the damage output since you know that Ed's weapon scales with Ed's stat. Also, the slow recharge of Fable charges didn't help to alleviate the boringness I felt during most of the game since most combat felt uninspired. You may say, but Max, how about boss weapons? They're unique, and you're 100% right. But the vast majority of the time, I chose the amulets over weapons, which it was my mistake, and I recognized that. And the only one that I played with for a while was etiquette, which isn't that good. Now, this perception changed when I bought the circular saw blade in Lorenzine Arcade, since you have to keep attacking to wind up the electricity damage and improve the fable art damage while that buff remains. I kept using this weapon until I understood how valuable the two dragon swords is. I brought these weapons because they have a very unique component to them, and it's not just poking and slashing, they dramatically change your damage output if you know what you're doing, unlike the rest of weapons. Enemies are weak to certain enemies, like carcasses to fire and puppets to electricity, but I've never noticed a huge or dramatic effect when those elements were activated on the enemy, but being fair, I wasn't able to level up advanced that much, so maybe with higher advance, the damage of elemental weapons is higher. Another question you may ask yourself is why I had so much trouble to get and understand the perfect guard mechanic, if all you need is timing. It's simple, with most fights you don't need to use it because regular enemies go down with 2 or 3 hits, so there's no point in engaging with this system with regular enemies because you don't gain an immediate benefit. That's why I got stuck on Fuoco. You can easily defeat the base enemies, no matter if you are at Central Crat or Arch Abbey. They're so easy that you can run behind them and backstab them. This is noticeable with Mad Donkey. He seems intimidating, but truly, all you have to do is go behind him and backstab him. Let's compare this with Bloodborne. In there, base enemies also go down with 3 or 4 strikes. 
but the difference is that the gun immediately puts them in a weak state and you receive a big opportunity to make massive damage whereas with Lies of P I never put on a groggy state on a base enemy because they go down very easily and it takes a lot of time for grogginess to activate. Now that doesn't mean that all battles are as easy as Mad Donkey, the reason is delayed attacks. Something that I strongly dislike was that some couple of hours into the game, you notice that the main enemies stop being the puppets in favor of the carcasses. There are solid storytelling reasons for why this happens, and I like those storytelling beats. But I have to say that neither the carcasses nor the humans are as cool and intimidating as the puppets. Look at Stella Opera House, there are some sick marionettes and spider puppets. Or let's mention the entire Frenzy Circus show. Not only the nightmarish, but each minimus was really difficult to beat. After a long journey, you will go back to Central Crat Station only to find out that it has been quickly overtaken by the petrification disease. I loved this. It's an amazing idea that carcasses are slowly possessing puppets, but they never did that with puppets that are more interesting. I was expecting to see a spider lady with tentacles, or the exploding marionette imploded with acid. Or how about creating abominations? I was hoping to see a carcass that took half of a jester and half of a mad clown and now it's a bizarre and disgusting combination of the trio and has the mobility and aggressiveness of the jester, the long reach of the clown and the acidic and dangerous nature of a carcass. Or how about the countless bodies on the street? I thought that they were going to possess everything that the carcasses could take and start to mix corpses with machines and whatever inorganic material they could find like cards, metal, glasses, or even other carcasses. In other words, I was thinking the more the petrification disease unleashes, the worse and more nightmarish and dangerous the enemies and the environments will be. Imagine one of those giant carcasses possessing the puppet that has a shower. Even though it's a carcass, it's immune to fire. Or imagine a carcass that takes possession of a stargazer. How would that work? Sadly, none of that ever happened. I don't know if it was way too difficult to develop or they had to cut it out because they couldn't find a proper balance or they didn't think too much about it, but it was a mistake to not go crazy and wild and start to miss everything because why not? Something that I saw many people missed was the multiplayer component. There's plenty of people who love PvP in this genre. I have never liked that, but it's important to mention that there isn't an online option. I quickly mentioned this, but I personally didn't like that you have to dump so many points into capacity. I wish the restrictions and limits on equipment were different, instead of forcing you to use so many points to have a regular weight a little bit below 50%. Maybe you're okay and comfortable with being slightly overweight, which causes slow energy regeneration, but that drove me insane in lengthy battles, and I just had to equip and equip it until the very end. I hope they find a better solution than just dumping half of your points into a random stat. Now, I wanna make this clear, this doesn't mean that the game is bad and I don't like it. I love Lies of P, and I think that there's a lot of untapped potential. I am not the best player, nor the smartest, but generally speaking, I had a good time, and once I found the mechanics that clicked with me, I was in love. Sadly, this happened almost in the end, but that doesn't diminish the positive experience I had. About the perfect guard, I've been thinking of ways to improve it without having to remove it or change it to a regular parry. I think something they need to add is a bar showing the grogginess level. In that way, you can see what actions do and do not affect it, and you can gauge if you, what you are doing is right or not. You can make this toggle for people who don't want to see it for whatever reason. Besides this, I think that a way to encourage people to use the perfect guard mechanic more is if the reward was a little bit better. Picture this, there's a new mechanic called Puppet Dance, where if you do an X amount of perfect guards in X amount of time, the enemy instantly go into grogginess, you bypass the building up, rewarding your active effort. If you fail, the grogginess will remain and all you have to do is to build it, and to not abuse the system, there can be a delay of X amount of time before you can active Puppet Dance again. With the P-Organ, you can upgrade the window to do perfect guards, lower the amount of perfect guards you need, and lower the cooldown period. The devs can even add new effects and gameplay changes when Puppet Dance is active. 
that only makes grogginess faster, but you can make more damage or it's easier to cast elemental damage, etc. You can even add that if you are damaged while Puppet Dance is active, you receive much more damage, your pool cells heal less, with each hit receive the Puppet Dance wears off weekly, etc. They can even create a new type of stance gameplay, whereas different puppet stances cast different outcomes and you choose how and what to use them and you can radically change them through the P organ. I want that type of gameplay element and I think that it would be a great addition and it won't clash with the genre or at the bare minimum I want them to make perfect guards more exciting and rewarding because to me it's not enough that perfect guards absorb HP damage. I think that the storytelling was really solid. It was a little bit more straightforward than what we are used on a Souls-like game. Plus, it's very clear that one ending is the real deal and the other ones are optional. It isn't like Dark Souls, where you can argue that several endings happen at the same time, but that doesn't diminish anything. One of the things that I'm liking the most is understanding the backstory. If you don't actually read all items, you're going to miss a lot of background and context. And even then, there are many things that you won't understand until you replay the game and really pay attention. A big reason why I took out the storytelling section from this video was because of that. It's very easy to pinpoint all the events of the game because we play it, but it gets harder with the backstory because you find a lot of information about one thing in different objects. A great example is Latsatia. If you don't read anything, you can kinda guess why she's there, but you won't be able to simply guess who she is and why she's there. In her specific case, you have to read about 5 different items to understand her motivations, and once you know her real name, you have to reread certain items to gain more insight about her and the alchemist's purposes. Another example is the puppet frenzy. We know that it was the Peto who caused it, and that's very clear, but what isn't clear is when he did it and how long the puppet frenzy has been going on. For a very long time, I thought that the puppet frenzy happened days or even a week before you start the game, and based on environmental storytelling, you may think that. A good example are corpses. They aren't that decomposed, so it cannot be that long since the frenzy started. But once you start to read all the items and objects related to that, it makes me question it. I still don't know when it started, but I am 100% sure that it's been way more than a week since it started. Also, it seems like it suddenly happened and everything went down in days, but that's not true. It was gradual until it went out of control. I love that they put so much backstory into the game. If you don't read, you will miss how and why they constructed a castle that eventually will be Hotel Krat, how long people are aware of Ergo, or how Krat isn't all shine and sparkles, but there was a huge and sharp social inequality. That's why that video is taking so long since I want to make a timeline of events and I want to explain why certain things happen in certain order. Another good thing was that there were plenty of really good and intense boss fights. Personally speaking, my favorite boss fights were Latsatia and Nameless Puppet. Both of them are challenging in a very different way. Latsatia is chaotic and agile and once you get her out of her armor, she just goes crazy and shows her power of the elixir that the alchemist imbued into her. It's crazy that it took them 890 test subjects to finally get the right proportion and have the first complete person. I actually hope that that theme is further explored in future games and have other crazy fights of people just manipulating the environment to make attacks, which seems over the top, but once you start to understand the story, it makes absolute sense. On the other hand, Nameless Puppet also feels chaotic and frenzy, but when you start to analyze it, you realize that it isn't like that. Whereas Letizia just makes 12 or 14 combo attacks and she makes lots of follow-ups and crazy stunts, the fight with Nameless is methodical and technical. You see that he tends to do 2 or 3 combo attacks and that's it. There's plenty of room to attack and plenty of opportunities to make a charge R2 attacks. So why is he so difficult? I think it is because he uses that against you. Besides Nameless healing like a truck, if you truly analyze it, you see that he attacks like a perfect version of you, with calm, method and patience. He doesn't need to do a string of countless attacks to get you, with a couple of well thought slashes is more than enough to deplete your HP. Also, he has this tendency of seamlessly mixing regular attacks with charge attacks that hurt even more, plus all his attacks are AoE you cannot easily run or evade them. 
Once he goes into his second phase, there isn't a dramatic change like Lysatia. Instead, he is way more aggressive, he has a secondary sword and his range of attacks is further updated. Again, if you analyze the second phase, you realize that he doesn't lose his methodical approach. All you did was unleash a beast. I think that the second phase of Nameless is a beautiful representation of Geppetto's fear and why he did everything he did. Nameless Puppet is totally unstable and when it's unleashed, all it wants is destruction. As much as I had so many troubles with this fight and it was the fight that I had to retry the most, I won't deny that this was peak Lies of P and the entire game built this moment. The devs could have easily made a boss fight very similar to Let's Asia, where it feels messy and chaotic with a very long string of attacks and combos with several fury attacks one next to the other, but I respect that they pulled the rug and still it's a full methodical battle from beginning to end. I really don't know if my opinion is unpopular, but I wish that more boss fights were like Light Seisha and Nameless Puppet. Instead of relying on cheap moves and feints, I wish that they were as fun as those two fights and had the immense lore and storytelling relevance that they have. Before jumping to my opinions about the future of the franchise, I have to quickly mention this. While traversing Rosa Isabella Street, you have to go into some sewers to eventually continue and go into the Opera House. While there, I made a clock that they used the exact same sample that Akira Yamaoka used while you are on the labyrinth on Silent Hill 2 and in the song A Stray Child from Silent Hill 3. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just hear this. I think it's pretty clear that Lies of P is a game that has many flaws, but it's exceptionally good and extremely polished. Every time that a game doesn't need a day one 30GB patch to solve a countless amount of bugs and performance issues, we have to note that and applaud it. I know that's the bare minimum, but sadly, we know that isn't always true with AAA gaming. It's unbelievable how good Lies of P is, and now that you know the behind the scenes, I hope that you like the game even more than before. Knowing that they struggle to get developers for consoles and that they have to use a lot of time to learn how to develop for consoles is crazy to me. I don't know if they did this before starting the production of the game, but again, even with the clear flaws, they did a really good job. They didn't try to copy the FromSoft formula, but what they did is take a genre that they clearly love and add their own spin without going too crazy. From here, all I want from them is pure growth. So are there going to be more games? Yes. As I mentioned, I had to write this last moment because the director already confirmed that a DLC and a sequel are coming. What the DLC and sequel will be, it's a little bit obscure, but we know as a fact that either one is going to be related to the Mage of Oz, since we see Dorothy, possible teleporting out of Krat. With the reveal of Dorothy and Gianga being Paracelsus, it's clear to me that they are going to make a franchise based on twisted dark fairy tale folklore. I hope that the Mage of Oz isn't the DLC, but the sequel, so they have enough time to flesh out another great game with great mechanics and a compelling story, but I hope that they dwell and double and triple down with that. I can see potential for games based on Little Red Hood, Hansel and Gretel or Cinderella. Hell, I wouldn't be surprised that they make one based on Alice in Wonderland, and who knows, maybe Paracelsus is secretly the Mad Hatter. At any rate, I 100 support them and I hope that they build this twisted fairy tale franchise and they keep building. I would love that each game is its own thing, but there could be core concepts repeated through them like some games are sequels or others are prequels, ergo the purification disease, etc. And maybe the alchemist remain as the main antagonist. Coming back to the DLC, you may not remember, but when they announced Lies of P back in 2021, we saw Geppetto walking towards Krat and it was snowy. Obviously, many things changed from then to now, but if you pay attention to this concept art for the DLC, we see this machine on ice. Are they gonna add a new ice environment? Maybe explain how Geppetto arrived at Krat? I don't know, but I hope so because that would be sick as hell. Well, this is it, pal. 
Making this script was really difficult and getting a little information I could about NeoWiz was also complicated, but I hope that I made justice to the game and you understand more about it. Now, I want to know from you, what are your critics of the game? Do you have a favorite boss fight? Let me know in the comment section and also tell me why you agree or disagree with any of my points. Thank you very much for watching, I hope to see you in whatever video I will upload next. I hope you have a wonderful day, Paul. Bye bye.